Saturday night at 11. It work out the same way, all right? Are you with me? And uh, but if you're earlier earlier than that, then you do that. I'm sort of a late night owl and uh, early rising too, so I have never needed eight hours sleep. I don't, I, it's just not part of my must be nice. psyche, psyche. But anyhow, <laughs> you say what, Kay? I need all I can get. I oh, okay. Nice. Well, some people that away. Some people need more than eight hours for that matter. But anyway, but uh, anyhow, we are so glad you're here. Phyllis, good to see you and Kevin. And good to have, uh, now, you, are you, are you, which one are you kin to? You kin to Becky or you kin to him? You wouldn't claim him if you were, would you? Amen. But anyhow, you're kin to Becky, aren't you? Grandson? Right. Okay. We've had him here on several occasions. We're always honored to have you. Good to see you. All right. Open your Bible. Where are we at anyway on Sunday morning? Oh, Revelation chapter 2. Good night. That's one minute. Did I even study last night? Yeah, I did. But anyhow. All right. Revelation chapter 2. And don't forget the time change. Please don't do that. And uh, you'll be here. I know one church, a mega church down in Jacksonville, Florida, that uh, every time change, fall and spring, they didn't change anything. They said, keep everything just like it is. Don't change your clock until after Sunday night. Well, that's and it worked for them, believe it or not. They didn't have anybody late. Anybody, uh, they claimed that Dr. Vines was a pastor there at that time. And uh, he, uh, he just uh, always did that. He said it just didn't make much of a dent in his crowd. So that's pretty good. I don't know. Every church I have a pastor makes a dent. Uh, some people just forget it. People don't think about it. And if you, especially in spring, you're going to miss it. Now, if you come in the fall, that's a good thing. You're an hour early. All right. I've never been an hour early in my entire life anywhere. But anyhow. All right. Go ahead. Say amen right there. All right. Go ahead. Y'all will pay for a longer sermon today. I want you to know. Instead of mid-noon, I'm going to be keeping you to about 1230. Most of you will be walked out by then. But anyhow. All right, we again are grateful to have you here today. All right, uh, Revelation chapter 2 and beginning in verse 12 as we journey through the seven churches of Asia Minor. And I am preparing and thinking and doing some things for, I guess, what James has requested more than anybody on future things, things to come. What does God say is for, in store for the world in the next whatever period of time? When is Jesus Christ coming? Do we know? Do we have any signs? Uh, I like what one preacher said. I quit looking for signs. I started looking for the Savior. Amen. Amen. And I'm sort of, of that I'm same uh, <laughs> idea. So anyhow, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2, would you stand on reading God's Word today with us? And uh, if you can't, God understands that. You stay seated, all right? Maxine, I'm talking to you, and I think you do anyway. Don't you, sweetheart? She can't even hear me. But anyhow, that's all right. But anyhow. John writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God and says to the angel or the pastor of the church. Hey, you're looking at, just call me Angel Bill. <laughs> That's what the angel represents in each of the seven churches. And we've already discussed that and looked at that. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seat is, thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days, wherein an Antipas was a faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast 
they're them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Things slow today. What in the world happened? <laughs> you got it. Go back to my verse. You're right. You're right. Uh, that's right. Oh, I got to go back. No, that's the verse you're on. That's, right. that's your own, right? 15. 15, right? Yeah, but I had to do it myself. Oh, yeah, okay. The screen oh, went sorry. blank. Oh, sorry. Okay. Did it go blank up here? No. no. Didn't go blank up here. No. See? So y'all have no idea why I stopped, did you? It just no. blank screen, blank screen. <laughs> so, so hast thou also among them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. I'm going to preach on that one Sunday. You have no idea the truth in that. Two words, white stone. You really don't. I just did a study of it a few weeks ago, and uh, it is astounding. It truly is. And uh, I'm going to have to do that one Sunday morning. But anyway, I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Today I speak on the message, the church at Satan's headquarters. And that's exactly what the Word of God says. Remember, uh, Satan's seat or throne was in that city. And in that place where this church is located. I Heavenly Father, again today, we thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for these seven churches that are pictures of us today. Of churches that's all about us. Of one or the other. And uh, of the phases that Christianity would go through. Uh, through all the ends of time. And Father, I pray today that, Lord, you would open up my, my, our eyes, our minds, our ears, and our hearts to receive the engrafted seed of the Word of God. I pray today, Lord, if there's someone here or someone watching online that needs the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, God, save that soul nearest hell today is our prayer. And again, we pray for the Holy Ghost of God. May you arrest this preacher. May you control my mind, my thoughts, my words, my mannerism, and all that I am. May I be totally yours, is our prayer. And God, I pray the power of God might fall on our listening as well as on the preaching. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you accomplish and you do. We'll give you all praise and always all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's church said, Amen. you can be seated. How many of you couples, married or dating or whatever may be the course, uh, ever have... I'll call it disagreements. Anybody here? Have, how many of you have disagreements? In, 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 we'll just say in your marriage. Paul's just shaking his head. Hey, so you're saying never with Christy, right? Is that what you're saying? Never? <laughs> he pleads the fifth, all right? But anyway, all right. Well, my wife and I, I know it's a, hard for you to believe, but sometimes we don't always agree on everything. Everybody understand that? And so we sometimes, but the amazing thing, over the long haul and over almost 50 years of marriage we've been together, uh, I'll be honest with you, I've always been amazed at her. I don't care what buttons I try to push with her, it just seems like it never works. She just says her little thing and she walks away, and I'll see her again. That's a good way not to, not to have a fight, amen? Uh, that's why we haven't had many fights. I, I learned a long time ago, if a man doesn't want to fight with his wife, just go outside. So I've been spending a lot of hours every week outside and outdoors. Chopping wood. But uh, she walks away. And so I asked her the other day, I said, we've been married almost 50 years, sweetheart. When we disagree on things, you never let it go. You, you, you just say your piece and you walk away. What is it that you do? How do you stay so calm and you don't stay in the conflict? She said, well, that's easy. I said, what do you do? She said, well, if you ever notice, I always go to a bathroom. I said, for what? She says, well, I learned a long time ago, I just do cleaning. I said, you mean to tell me cleaning helps you? She said, yeah, tremendously. 
keeps me calm, cool, and collective. And uh, I forget about the argument almost immediately. And I said, how? How in the world does that work? Why does that work? She said, that's easy. She says, I clean the toilet. And I said, well, what's that got to do with the conflict? She says, I use your toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow. Enough said right there. All right. When you come to the seven churches, again, they're all located in Turkey of today. All right. In fact, some maps will still show, especially the older ones, exactly where these locations are. And if you have the ability, and you do online, you can take the map of Turkey and the cities of Turkey where these churches were located, take the old map underneath, and you will see where each of the new cities, differently named, some don't even exist, to be honest with you, only a few. Some of them do. And you can see exactly where they were strategically placed by God in that portion of the world. And so these are seven churches located in Asia Minor. Pergamos actually is the capital of Asia Minor. This is one of the most influential cities of all cities that had a church located within its boundaries. It was a city well known, and there's some things we do know about it. It was a luxurious city, a beautiful city, a very wealthy, well-to-do city in itself. It was also a city known for fashion. If you were going to know anything about Pergamos, you would think, hey, what's Pergamos known for? Many would say it was known for its fashion designing. And I'm not talking about buildings. I'm talking about clothing. It was the pairs of their day, all right, of Asia Minor and that particular region of the world. It was also a very intellectual city. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's true, statistically. Everywhere there is a major university located within a radius of so many miles, you have less churches, you have less Christians, and you have less saved. Anybody know why? Because education teaches against everything we stand for. Think about that. Charlottesville has its churches. They just don't have many right kind. I'm being honest. Okay? Uh, wherever major universities are, that's a, that, when I say major, all right? Larger ones. Uh, and uh, so intellectualism breeds contempt for God. All right? Now, I'm not saying it, to be a Christian, you got to be stupid. And dumb. I have some degrees, all right? I actually went to college. I goes to school. I want you to know that. <laughs> but uh, I want you to understand that intellectualism is not a friend of Christianity. Never has been, never will be. And one of the reasons the city was known for its intellectualism and its knowledge and its education was due to the fact something else was there, and which I find interesting. It had the world's largest, at that hour and time frame, library. Now, you've got to understand, when I say library back then, it's different than today's libraries. There was no printing devices. Every book written on its shelves had to be handwritten. Think about that. Say, so how large was the library? 200,000, over 200,000 volumes they boast in history. All right? That's a lot of handwriting. Amen? Wow. And uh, so that led to the city's intellectualism. And so, again, keep in mind, an intellectual city becomes more difficult to reach with the gospel because of just the teaching and the training. But they're located in this town. Not only was a Christian church, but also one that stood for God, but also there were some temples there. The temple of Caesar was there. He made sure every major metropolitan of the city had a temple or a church to worship Caesar. Remember last week we shared with that? And all the martyrs that were ever uh, martyred, and we gave you a statistic the other week, what would I give you? Uh, five million, history tells us. Over five million Christians were crucified, uh, led to the gladiator games, fed to the lines, whatever you want to, whatever way they're new, man, put on the rack we taught you about, where they pull pull your four on a rack until they pull pull your lig ligaments loose, then your muscles are pulled loose, and then you just continually pull until they all four pull out, and you eventually die, both from pain, shock, and everything else. Uh, so it was a way of torturing those who represented and those who stood for Jesus Christ. But also in this town, there were many other pagan temples. One of the most popular temples was the Temple of Asclepius. Asclepius is the temple of medicine, 
and actually still exists today in symbolism. You say, what are you talking about? You've never thought this, but every time you go to a doctor, especially in the old days, and on their documents, you would see a symbol of this idol. All right? Carried still over today, by the way, the major company for insurance in America uses it on every piece of their stationery. Anybody know what it is? Any guesses? Blue Cross Blue Shield. Literally carries it. I'm gonna Did I not see your picture? Didn't come through? I didn't see one. Oh, man. What is wrong with my computer, man? I'm sending these pictures so you can see. Anyway, anybody ever seen a pole with a snake on it and the poles are crossed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's, it comes from this particular city. All right? Wow. Because that is exactly the symbolism for that temple in that day and that hour. Now, let me, give you, let me give you a couple of things about the city. Then we'll go into this temple and give you a little a couple more facts of what went on in this temple. But Because it does apply to some of the things we're going to look at over the course of the next two weeks. But it was a very famous city. Famous for one thing. Last week we told you Smyrna was famous for what? Anybody remember? Myrrh. Myr. All right? A medical, uh, a medicine in that day to alleviate some pain and discomfort. But when you come to the city of Pergamos, it was known particularly, and probably that's why the library was there, for its parchment made there out of sheepskin. All right? Uh, anybody here ever remember when you graduated, whether it's high school, I graduated seminary and something, they will give you a degree, and out of that degree is a parchment. Very pretty. Now, I used to have them always in my office. Not that I'm just about my education. If you hear me preach, you wonder if I have a head in me. But anyhow. But uh, the parchment, uh, we would sometimes call a degree or some one when you got, oh, I got my sheepskin. Ever heard that phrase? And that's where it comes from. So they were very, very well known, and this is, that is where parchment actually began to be made. So let's go back to the temple of Asqua, uh Lapis. Hard for me to remember that word. Asclepius. Asclepius was the temple of healing and the temple of medicine to those people. That was the idol that they would pray to and go into when they were sick and they needed what they considered the touch of their God. Are you with me? Now, what did it imply and what did it mean? For somebody to go into the temple of Ascalapis, literally, <coughs> they would go in at night. They would lie down on the floor of the temple and it would be more than sometimes one. And then sometime during the night, the priest would release something inside the temple. They crawled. And they were everywhere. And they're called snakes. I'm not making this up. This is historical, okay? And snakes would come crawling everywhere throughout the temple. And whenever one crawled over your body, they would declare that was the hand of God touching their body and that they would be healed. I'm, just, I'm making this up. This is what I'm telling you, all right? And so I'll tell you what. Most of you, when, when you were lying there, number one, you wouldn't probably have been there anyway, but had you done that, most of you wouldn't have been healed. You'd be dead. Amen and amen. Uh, if you don't like snakes, and some of us don't. I, don't they don't bother me. I have a family member. I had most of my family members scared to death of them. But they don't bother me. I don't kill snakes. I let them live, even around my house. Uh, because they're good things. Trust me, they really are. But anyway. So, uh, the snake on the pole, blue cross, blue shield. All right? Now, something else about the seven churches. Out of seven churches of Asia Minor that we're looking at and studying over the next weeks, five of the seven had problems. Only two. One which we just preached on last week. The church at Smyrna. The most suffering of all the churches. In Asia Minor. Uh, literally was one that had no problem. We're going to look at another one in chapter 3. That God makes only compliments to about them. But this church had a problem. I'll give you what the problem really was. Summed up in one word. Compromise. Nothing else. They just were compromising. Ear tickling. Back scratching. Soft soap, pink tea, lemon, lemonade, kind of preaching, teaching church. All right? Uh, Panty-wearing preachers were there. All right? 
that didn't have any backbone. They were afraid to stand up for righteousness, stand up for the word of God, even though they are committed, some of them. Keep in mind, in each of the seven churches, and still today, in all churches as well as most denominations, there has always been a little remnant that stays right. All right? God's always had a remnant. Even in Israel, he's always kept an remnant that's been faithful to his word, faithful to him. And so we need to understand that. So the problem at Pergamos was compromise. In fact, we read it to you today. They compromised with Satan's headquarters. They compromised with Balaam's teaching. They taught what the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitanism started in Pergamos and that church, and we'll teach you more next week about what these things all are involved, not today, but next week. It will show you how very compromised this church really was. And by the way, the church of Pergamos is loaded throughout the valley and loaded without loaded throughout America today. Amen. Preachers are scared to death to say boo to the boogeyman. <laughs> All right? They preach what they think people want to hear. Yeah. Seriously. Everybody's afraid of their job. I guess that's what it is. I've never understood that. I've never been one of those kind of preachers. I just tell it like it is. Let it fall where it falls. If it falls on you, so be it. If it doesn't, praise God. Amen? And uh, if you don't like it, lump it. Anybody ever hear that? I'm just that kind of always been a guy preacher. I started off that way, and I ain't about to change that. Too old, too long been doing that. So anyway, I must say we're straight shooter in prison when I'm in prison. Man, those guys will tell you, I ripped their faces off. In fact, what I find interesting, I got a letter this week from a man by the name of Larry, okay? So you don't know his last name. Nobody knows the last name. A lot of Larry's in prison. But uh, one that we go at pretty regularly, and Larry contacted me. Actually, two letters in the last past month, and uh, we addressed it when we got there in prison and said, hey, thank you for the letter. I did read it because he asked me. He said, did you read my letter? I said, sure. I even prayed for your request. And I'm praying today for Darsh. His mother's dying, and he may not see her before she dies. She has cancer. And they're giving her about six months, and he's got long with that. And here's the thing. And there are some, and I believe with all my heart, the spirit dies with my spirit. And so did David at, at uh, the prison out in Augusta, when David said, I'm innocent. I've been here. Good night. He was almost there 30 years, literally, hmm. and of his life. And got out when he was almost pushing up a 50s. And uh, he, he got there. But he was innocent. And the state of Virginia eventually proved it. So 30 years of life gone. And, he, of course, he, I remember he's the one I told you about. Didn't want to suit Virginia because it said if it wasn't for going to prison wrongfully I'd already be dead and in hell but it was in prison I got saved and met Jesus Christ as my savior and thank God for that but Larry can I tell you about Larry first service he came into my service and he's sitting on the left of the Lord told him, by the way I know him so well because he's our water boy by that that's what he calls himself I'm your water boy preacher he brings me the water every Sunday I mean every service so I can have something to drink. And I drink a lot because I have a dry throat problem and so forth. So, understanding that, you remember the first time he came in service, possibly? First first service he came into, I mentioned a sin. I won't tell you what the sin is, but I, the minute I hammered that sin, he got up and he walked out. Nobody else moved, only him. And later I was going to find out from the head of the church, boy, when you hit that sin, he didn't like it. And so, let me, let me tell you how strong prison churches are. What a God we would put into practice some of what prison churches do. I'm serious. The very next service I was there, the head of the church, like a pastor, so to speak, okay? We call him Shorty because he's short, stocky. <clears throat> Shorty stood up. He said, I'm here to declare to everybody here, you better not walk out on this preacher. And if you do, you will basically suffer consequences. Mm. And nobody should ever. That's embarrassing. It shows that the church here isn't right. I mean, man, he just went on preaching to a man. Amen. Are you with me? That's true. But now Larry likes my wife and I. In fact, that's what the letter's all about, complimenting some things over the course. Because he's been, he's been there and he's been more faithful over the last months. Because he used to have a job on that particular one several times that we're there. And he couldn't come to prison. But I say that to say, that, say, hey, it pays sometimes not to compromise. Yep. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. So many preachers are bought off today. Come on. That's true. Yeah. That's right. 
Worried about their pocketbooks. <laughs> yep. Worried about if they're going to keep a job if they say something to somebody or if they offend somebody. Can I tell you what? When I read this book, I'm offended all the time. Amen. Amen. Okay? And if somebody's really going to preach it like it needs to be preached, you're going to get offended. That's right. Because the Holy Ghost of God is going to arrest you, convict you, prick you, and say, you know what? You ain't right with God. So, hey, I'd rather stand with God than anybody else I know. Yep. Amen? Yep. Then worry about my bottom line, or worry about this, or worry about that. So Pergamos was a compromising church, and we'll look at how badly they were compromised last week. The word in the Greek, Pergamos, and the city itself, literally means to be married to. It was a church that was married to two things. Married to false religion... Even though it had a remedy, keep in mind, he does commend some in the church, all right? Doesn't mean the whole church, it means some in the church. And they were married also just as much in the church is today to the world. They try to find out what works in the world. That's why churches are putting on concerts, I'm going to be honest with you, that looks more like rock concerts in my day. The only thing they haven't started getting, I'm looking for that, a mosh pit. You don't. You ain't never been to one, have you? No. No. Okay. Well, you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. But anybody know what a marsh pit? You don't know what a marsh pit is? Are you serious? You know what a marsh pit is, don't you? It's where the where, where the crowd stands up and they stand around the closest, not seats, but the closest people are in the marsh pit. And sometimes those guys who are rockers and so forth will just simply come on the marsh pit while they sing with a microphone, and they'll just do this, and the marsh pit holds them up, and then they'll pass them around. I'm serious. Yeah. Man, where y'all been, man? Y'all been, y'all been locked behind doors somewhere. But anyhow, nobody else here knows about them. You do, don't you? Good. I'm glad somebody. I, I'm in good company. We're in good company. Anyway. So Pergamus means to be married to false religion, as well as Pergamus was married definitely to a lot of worldliness. And that's where the church is today. And that's where it's going rapidly. And I'm going about every denomination. I'm going to talk, by the way, independent Baptists are going that way across the country. People are changing. Can I tell you why? They think, I'll do anything to get a crowd. And that's exactly what we are. And by the way, the shoe fits not with the church. Now, I blame the people for listening and seeing and observing but not doing anything about it. But the, the buck stops always, always with the preacher of that church. Amen. Did you hear me? Yep. Pergamos means to be married to. Look again at verse 12. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things saith he that hath the what? Okay. I don't know about you. Anybody here ever try to cut with a dull sword? A dull knife? Tough, isn't it? I mean, I've done it. I've even done it with some axes. And I split wood all the time. I split some yesterday. But can I just simply tell you, uh, I haven't tried out the thing yet. I did this by hand yesterday, Pete. But anyhow, he came out and, and, and gave me some recommendations on how to fix my, my log splitter. But um, I did it by hand yesterday. But can I tell you what? It's a lot better when it's sharp. All right? But why would Jesus Christ vocalize, of all things, he that hath a sharp sword? And by the way, it doesn't stop there. He goes a step further, doesn't he? With two edges. You gotta understand. In biblical times, swords were a symbol of power and authority. Okay? Rome was known for its combated ability, close range, sword fighting. Okay? Now they had archers, uh, they had other tools and, and cow puts and all that with big stones that they would hurl at, at uh, rock walls and other such things when they were attacking a city. But they were known for close battle. And a sword, you better have a sharp sword if you're going to be close in battle, especially when you start cutting people. And after a while, the thing gets dull. You understand what I'm talking about? And so it's not just a sword, but it happens to be sharp and it happens to be two edged. Why? Because God, whenever the symbol of sword is used, when it's in reference to God, it always means the same thing, by the way. Always. Check it out. It always is a symbol of God's word. Do you hear me? Not a little sword, but the word of God. Why? 
Why does it have to be sharp? Last time, you know why people get offended when somebody preaches this and it gets all over their case? Because <laughs> ah! you get stabbed with it. And you walk out mad instead of glad. You walk out offended instead of, and defended, trying to defend it, rather than walking out letting this book do what it's supposed to do in your heart. Are you with me? Does it make sense? Two engine. Why two? We know about the sharpness of the Word of God. And by the way, Hebrews says it is sharper than any two engine sword. Talking about the Word of God. If Paul wrote Hebrews, and whoever wrote it was a penman, God's inspired. Why two engine? Because isn't it true that the Word of God hurts, but it also helps and heals? Amen? It preaches judgment, but does it not also give us a lot of grace? Two engine. Love, but judgment as well. Are you with me? So it's two engine. It cuts both ways grace, mercy, patience, and long suffering, but it also cuts judgment, wrath, hail. All right? And so it's a two engine sword. So why would he address this church that way? What did I just tell you was a problem? So I tell me, what was a problem, main problem I've already taught you about Pergamos? Compromise. Every compromise in a church falls on this book because they drift from it. They refuse to believe what it teaches exactly. Listen, do you understand how many pastors are divorced in America preaching today still? This book teaches against that. And preachers are scared to death stand on it. Okay? And just because you've been divorced, God doesn't hate you. I'm not preaching that today. God loves you. All right? And sure, the second marriage can sometimes, uh, whatever, third, whatever, you know, can, can sometimes make a difference. But I'm just here to tell you, this book doesn't need to be compromised in any area. God still says it. Whether we like it, lump it, or leave it. Hates, I'm just telling you what he said, hates divorce. Hates it. Oh, but don't you know the exclusion? Yeah, I know about the exclusion law. But I can also tell you, nine out of ten don't follow that law, by the way. Are you with me? I'm just simply telling you, we need to get back to the book and live it, preach it, walk it, talk it, like God expects it to be. Amen? Compromise always comes because of Fallacies and falsehood or just disbelieving or changing what this book says and this book teaches. Why are you getting no amens there? But anyway, that's a fact. <coughs> and rightly so. So it's a symbol of power, the sword, and the word is powerful. By the way, Christ is powerful and the authority for everything. And by the way, that's the authority of life, faith, and living. The word of God. Amen? Every time God writes a letter to each of these seven churches, he always follows basically the same pattern. All right? In fact, out of seven of them, all of them is the same pattern. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? He always first gives them a word of com commendation. He compliments them for some things. He said, you're doing good in some areas. And then he lowers the book. And that's sort of how we are. If you're going to reprimand somebody, don't you always bring it, bring them in? Don't you always? I always have. I always build them up a little bit, then I pop their bubble after they're there. <laughs> Just telling you how you ought to do it if you're a leader. You don't go straight for the, the, the jugular vein the minute they walk into the office. You compliment them. You're nice. You're kind. Okay? And that's exactly what God's doing. God compliments every one of these seven churches, even though some of them have questioned whether or not they should be complimented at all. But God, God, amen? But he always gives a commendation. The commendation this church gets, and the only one it gets, is for their testimony. There were some in this church that had a good, godly, right testimony regarding the Word of God, regarding living the Word of God, and regarding living for God. And rightly so. Look what he says in verse 13. I know thy works. In other words, it had some in their church still working, serving God. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, thou holdest 
fast my name. Isn't that a good thing? Has not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. So he commends them always. Always. Sort of like the, the, the husband and the wife uh, got the report card from the little boy from school and then straight F's. You can't get any worse than that. So how hey, you know, I had a couple of those. All right? uh, I felt like I did. I sort of had a few D's in there here and there. But anyway. But uh, can I just simply tell you, by the way, you can take a D and turn it into a B real easy. You can take an F, they're real easy to turn into B's. Can I just tell you what? But anyway. But, uh, not recommending that to your daughter or anybody else here. But, anyway. <laughs> but the parents got the report card, man, F, 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 F. And the mother started scolding, and, and the father said, Stop, honey. This isn't all bad. She said, What? Not all bad? All F's isn't bad to you? Oh, no, no. This means our son has something good to brag about. And she said, what in the name of heaven do we have to brag about all the ass on his report card? And he's only 10 years old. She said, well, you got to be honest. At least we know he's not cheating from anybody. <laughs> amen and amen. <laughs> not a pretty good thing, don't you agree? But can I tell you, this church had a testimony. I want to say this to everybody here if you're saved by the grace of God. You have a testimony. I'm going to go a step further. Though Christians normally don't see it, the greatest possession you possess is your testimony. And by the way, this wicked world we live in are the church members, godless people outside the church, at work, in the office place, and we go a step further, family members watch us like hawks. If we really take a stand on the job and we really give out tracts and we witness and we just try to live for God literally 365 days a year, you can take it to the bank. People are watching you. And can I tell you why they watch you? They're trying to watch you mess up. Now listen to me well. I've had men in my office, generally most men, that come in and say, I've lost it. What did you lose? I lost my testimony. I blew it this week. Preachers in prison twice that we've been in church prison services before I speak and we do our thing have rebuked men who got in fights that were members of the church. Listen, they called them up. They called them out. And they rebuked them in Jesus' name and practiced 1 Corinthians, which no church today has practiced. Wow. You hear me? So if I knew something about you and I called you up here today, how would you feel? And these guys are inmates. Some of these guys are murderers. Okay, rapists. God knows some of them don't even care. I know they go to federal prison. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so they're not afraid to rebuke in the prison church. I thank God for that. But listen, the most treasured possession you possess, not your home, your car, though that's where most people live. It's your testimony. Why? Because all you got to do is slip up. Say one false word at work, one curse word, and somebody near you who you witnessed it, forget it. You won't ever win that guy. That's over. Go out and drink one beer with somebody. Try to witness to them then. That ain't going to happen. Think about it. Get caught in some major lie. And then try to witness somebody just caught you in that lie. Don't listen to anything you say. They don't think you're lying about going to heaven. Being saved. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand why I'm trying to place? Hey, there's only two kinds of testimonies all over this house. Okay? Only two, if you say. Now, actually, there's three. There's some here that may not even have a testimony for God because you're not saved. The other two are you either have a good testimony or you have a bad where you are. You have no blooming idea as a pastor of sheep for almost 50 years. In fact, I did take 50 years. I've been in the ministry already, just not pastor 50 years. But I've been in the ministry 50 years. Can I just simply tell you this? And I'm not making this stuff up. I still remember one of the first instances I had when I moved to Shenandoah Valley. We had a member in our church. I'm, I'm telling you. 
And Ballard Barnes called me on the telephone. And you would have thought I was the guilty culprit the way he started talking to me. <laughs> this pastor across the road, yeah, this is. I took blah, 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 started attacking me. I said, stop. What in the world am I? He said, got you. It's one of your members. Rotten members you got in your church. Don't pay his bill. Minute I asked, I almost didn't have to ask because I already figured out who it was. Mm -hmm. And I did have it pegged. I already knew. Didn't have to give me their name. I already knew because I knew they had a lack of character. Mm -hmm. It takes care to pay the debts on time. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay? Are you with me? So, you either have a good or poor or bad testimony for God. How's your testimony today? What does your family think of your Christianity? Seriously. How do they see your Christianity lived out 365 days a year? Anybody can look good here. Anybody can walk into church and look good. Are you with me? Yeah. Quite another thing to walk out and live it. Put it in shoe leather. Mm -hmm. 365 days a year. So we need to understand when you have a testimony, you either elevate his name or you deflate his name. You either honor him or you bring dishonor unto him. Serious business. All right, by the way, some Christians go out of here prematurely because of that. According to Corinthians, yep. many sleep. God just took them out because they were dishonoring his name. Not living, not walking, not talking, not doing what they are supposed to do as they live for God and they live for Jesus Christ. Do you understand today how important your testimony is? Do you, everybody here understand that if you're truly saved, the devil can't get you? Amen. The devil can't damn us, thank God. He can't destroy you. I'll tell you what he can do, and he works at it night and day with his demons of hell. <laughs> he tries to stumble you, mess you up. Wreck and ruin your living and life for God. Why? Because the next best thing to an unsaved, wicked, godless man who spits his poison out and lives his poison every day in front of children, grandkids, and everything else, influencing them for hell and for, for sin in the world, is a Christian who has totally lost their testimony. Right. He's having churches preaching better than I thought. So, let me just simply urge you, guard your testimony. Guard your heart. Guard your life. Because all of our effectiveness for him is totally based on your testimony, on mine. You understand me? That's the reason some kids in homes go to the devil. Because they've seen the inconsistency of parents. Living one thing at home, living another at church. Are you with me? And boy, if there's one thing teenagers can't stand, it's hypocrisy. They detest it. They may be little hypocrites, but they don't want mom and dad to be no hypocrite. And that's why multitudes of kids leave even sometimes churches because they were made to go. And the minute they get of age, they're out of here. Because they saw no consistency at home. Of godliness at all lived out. Dad still lose a temper. Dad still cuss. Mama still cuss. Um, parents just living like always fussing, feuding, and fighting. But who wants to be in that? And they come into the house of God. Oh, isn't this a great day? Praise God. <laughs> and they just have a knock down, drag out battle in front of the kids in the car before they pull to the parking lot. Seriously. How do you know this preacher? You have no idea the teenager has been in my office over my lifetime. To tell me the blatant inconsistency of families I would never have known about had they not came because they wanted out. And they couldn't understand preaching. You preach, you do this, you do this. Mom and dad don't live anything you say. They fed you, they fried you over lunch. <laughs> By the way, you can have fried preacher today. I couldn't care less. <laughs> All right? Now, I tell you what's wrong. Here's what's happened. So many people are bent on worried about their 
quote unquote <clears throat> reputations. You understand a reputation ain't squat. You understand a reputation stinks in that. Can I give you the definition of reputation? Anybody here know what a definition? It's what people think you are. That's right. What you better be more concerned about having real, godly, honest character of heart and life. So that when your children watch or your grandkids watch you daily when they're around you, how you talk, if you lose your temper, whatever it is, that they can leave and say, you know what, I know one thing, my grandparents love God. And they live it. That has power. But when they leave and they got grandparents just like the world or something else they've lived up with or seen on TV or whatever, I'll tell you what, Grandpa might be a preacher, but he's a sorry one. And I can give you a bunch of names of those. Okay? And their kids have proven it, by the way, in a lot of cases. Reputation, character, is what God, listen to this, character is what God knows and who God knows you are. Get the difference? One has to do with people. I couldn't care less what people think. But if I'm this away right, this, the majority will say, hey, I believe he believes what he believes. I had a guy in prison back. This guy didn't like me. Why do people not like me? I just don't understand that sometimes. And there he said, they, you know who I'm talking about, right? Uh, in that particular prison. He came, he came, he came to me. He said, can I, can I, be, uh, can I make, give, give you a confession? This is after church service. Bro. I said, sure. He said, I, I didn't like you. I said, well, you've been coming. He said, that don't make me not like you. I just want I just want to come to church because it's the right thing to do. I said, why don't you like me? He said, I, I didn't like the way you preach. He said, you raise your voice a little bit, and you look like you get mad occasionally. But then at the same time, you also show me that you really do love us. That guy just met with me several months later. He said, can I be honest with you and frank with you? Pastor, I love you now. You're my favorite preacher. You got his heart right with God. See, when you get your heart right, everything else falls in place. <laughs> hey, they had a difficult testimony. I know that works. Look at the t- difficulty of their having a testimony and living it. They were where Satan's headquarters were. Thou, thou dwellest even where Satan's throne is the word seat. Throne or headquarters is. And thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith. Even in those days, what days are you talking about? The days of Antipas. Who's Antipas? Antipas was one of the pastors. What happened to him? They took his hide out because he refused, the emperor did, refused to bow down to Caesar. He gave a command to the soldiers to light the fires of a huge bull kettle. By the way, you can go online and find this. This actually, you can find pictures and images of this. And they put water in it, boiling hot. And they had him in the midst of it so that it was like, you know, you can do a, a, a frog or a lobster. That's how they boil lobsters. Lobster feels comfortable in that seawater. Put the big old pot on the stove. Start putting the heat on it. Put the lobster in it. Man, he's swimming around. He's happy as a lark. Man, right kind of place. But little by little, gradually, gradually, guess what happens to seawater? On a stove, in a pot, boiling. It starts getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And tell you what happens to the lobster? He's at home now. He's comfortable. It started with comfort. <laughs> Until the next thing he knows, he's being eaten by somebody. <laughs> Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? And so he simply says, I, man, you have a difficult place to maintain your testimony and live. They literally lived under the shadow of the devil's headquarters. It was that bad in that. By the way, it hasn't changed in America. Everybody here agree there's some cities full of the devil? That's most major cities are. Gambling? Hey, hey, when I, when I say this city, you don't, you don't think of churches? You will not think of Boy Scouts. You will not think of Mama. You will not think of your grandparents. You will not think of love. You will think of anything reversed opposite of any of those other things when I use the word Las Vegas. What do they promote? Even on all the brochures. The gambling capital of the world. 
that just is a b big word for being an idiot and lose all your money. Amen. Yeah, that's right. To think you're going to win, you've got to be stupid. Mm -hmm. How do you think they can afford the bill to pay <laughs> on all those things by robbing your exactly. money? Exactly. By making sure you may win once in a blue moon to keep you addicted to it, but you'll lose your shirt. Can I tell you what? That's one big place I don't. I couldn't care less about this. Me neither. Hell City. That's what it's been called. Sin City. Do you understand what? Why? Satan's headquarters. I'm not telling you there's not churches around it. I'm not telling you there's not some good men. Actually, I have a friend who started a church right in Las Vegas. Okay? They're doing pretty well. There's a sword on the outskirts of the city. So, man, think about it. Full of every kind of vice and man. Notice he says, thou dwellest. Two Greek words for dwell in the Bible. Just for your information. One is temporary. Temp temporal dwelling. In other words, when people come to the valley and they're going to stay here for a week, they may get a motel room or one of those deals, I forget what they call them, where you're going to live for a week in a place cheaper than if you get a motel room. And they, you know, get the kids, what is it called? Airbnb or whatever. And they even have motels now that's sort of like Airbnb, but they, you, you rent them for a month, you rent them for a week. How long are you going to be in town? Are you with me? That's temporal. The permanent, it also means permanent, by the way. The word used, dwellest here. They were dwelling in Satan's headquarters is used for a permanent dwelling. What does it mean, preacher? It means there was no change ever going to take place in that town. That church would have some influence, yes, but they would not change that city. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Let me ask everybody this question. Do you really think there's churches changing cities today? I can tell you, this city, I've preached that many times over the years, not far from here. They now have girly things. I won't go any further. Okay, on the streets. Open. Just recently, two years ago, they now have, they're boasting of Virginia's top gambling casino. Okay? I've preached that many times. There's some good churches there. But can I tell you what's happened? Churches didn't say it. We don't have enough to care anymore. I really believe this. So that we don't keep out the garbage like we used to be over here. You understand we kept Decatur dry for the whole five years I was there. It was the fifth year when Governor George Wallace. But we had Methodists, Presbyterians, and Baptists. Shucks, they don't want it dry. Most preachers want saloon now because they're drinking preachers. Come on! And we wonder why we're in such a mess. So it's a permanent dwelling. It's not a chain. Let me hurry and say, look at verse 13. I know where thou dwell. Aren't you glad he knows where you live? I'm glad he knows about every care, every burden, every heartache, every pain, every tear I shed. He loves me that much. And he cares for me that much. Praise God. Amen. He knows every difficult place I will ever or you will ever be. Anybody here remember the old song? My Lord knows the way. I haven't heard, I haven't, I haven't even heard this for years. We sing it all the time. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. is follow. And he still does. He said, I know, preacher. I've been through a few. And every time he's taking me by the hand, he walked me right through that valley until I got back on the mountaintop. And then, the amazing thing about that, you're not on the mountaintop very long before you find out. <laughs> you know, mountaintops aren't usually real long. I mean, Blue Ridge Park is pretty long. I mean, it's, it's a rarity, but mountaintops usually... You know, you get up here, and you're up, not up here long for you're back like in the valley again. Have I ever discovered that in Christian life? Sure you have. All of us have sometimes been there. When I finished seminary, I thought my education was, was through. But can I tell you what? It was really just beginning. Because I have been attending the University of Hard Knocks ever since. All right? Hard knocks, burdens, hurts, heartaches. That's just part pastor, can I just tell you that? But theirs was a difficult time. Let me quickly get ready to close. It was a definite testimony. They had a clear cut. Hey, can I just tell you, when God says something in the Word of God, it's so. When He says they had a testimony, and He knew that they had a difficult time in a place where they were living for God, He knew he had the goods on them. When God in the Bible says that John the Baptist was great, He was great. Not so much today when we sometimes boast about, oh, I think so-and-so is such a great preacher. How do you know? You don't know that person. 
You said, well, I can't preach all the time. Hey, you can be a great preacher if you live like the devil at home. That's right. Yeah. I can give you a name of one right now. I know for a fact there's a devil in the sky, in the pulpit. Okay? What he said in the pulpit had no living at all in his home. Okay? I'll tell you what I think he is. I think he's a goat. Even though he doesn't say it. I don't think he's a sheep. I think he's been a goat all along. Okay? Unless something's changed since I knew him. But anyway. So it's a definite testimony. I know thou works where thou dwellest, even where Satan sees. Thou holdest fast my name. That word fast means faithful. To bear it high. To hold it in high esteem. Are you with me? Hey, I don't know about you. Best thing in church ought not to be it's singing. Really ought not to even be it's preaching. Or not to be it's fellowship. Or not to be it's ministries. The best thing going for any church ought to be Jesus. Amen. Point blank. Plus nothing, minus nothing. I don't know about you. I love the name of Jesus. I love him. I'm not ashamed to say it. Okay? I tell him every day, throughout the day, I love you, Lord. Man, how do you put up with me? Amen? I don't see how he puts up with me. I really don't see how he puts up with Paul. <laughs> Even Christy can't hardly do that. Amen? <laughs> Teasing you, Paul. But anyhow, Harold sings in prison and has many times in our churches one of his favorite songs. What a lovely name is the name of Jesus. And it is, isn't it? Jesus is the sweetest name I know in our hymn book. There is a name I love to hear in the hymn book. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's something about the name of Jesus. Amen. And thank God. We had a West Virginia family, and I'll tell you, Mitch. You know who Mitch is. I actually recall this book. <laughs> She thinks this is thorn, but it's much sharper than she does. <laughs> but Mitch came back from vacation, Paul, back in the days when Christians attended church on vacation, and we did for years and years and years. I could tell you stories of some we attended at the beaches. That's another story, trust me. But like Mitch, he was at the beach and he attended the Baptist church while he was there. The minute he came back, he was one of my deacons in West Virginia. He came and said, I want to talk to you at the church. Sure. He said, Preacher, he said, I had to tell you, I went to church while I was there. My family and I, even my girls asked me questions when we left the church. He said, I'm telling you, so he said, I attentively listened to every song, every prayer, every word the preacher spoke. And as a Baptist church, that's what made me worse. He said, I want to tell you point blank. I never, and I even asked my family, I never, no, never heard one single time or reference to Jesus Christ. Not one time. Not one time. He said, as I did his church. He said, I did church. I picked the wrong church, preacher. I said, I've done that on vacation several times too, all right? So I'm just simply saying, hey, they're out there. That was good. Now, that would be that would be many years ago when we were in West Virginia. We didn't come here until 1990. You think I knew that, did you? September 19th. Just wanting to impress her with my great past. <laughs> but, but anyway, look at verse 13. Has not denied, notice what he said, not your faith, not our faith, has not denied my faith. By the way, there is no faith except Christ's faith. Religion, yes. Churches, yes. But only one faith, my faith, his faith. Amen. That's what makes Christianity completely different. We have no faith except faith that's found in Him. Amen? Amen. Can I just simply tell you, I don't know about you. I told you about Anubis was faithful unto death, literally. By the way, after they bore him, they roast him in that pan. It was a huge idol, is what it was. To a bull. I guess that was whatever that temple was that he was murdered in, martyred in. But he was faithful unto death, wasn't he? Can I tell you the greatest asset next to your testimony you have in life is by being faithful? Faithfulness, period. Think about it. How important faithfulness is. Can I give you some? Disagree with me if you want. I'm serious. Raise your hand and say, oh, I don't disagree with that. We'll give you, a, give you a couple rundowns. How important is faithfulness really? Faithfulness to the church? Should we be? Absolutely. 
Favor of uh, jobs? Yes. yes. Workforce? Boy, that's some you saw. That's mm-hmm. a nightmare. Faithful in sports? No, not well, you yeah. can do that. But for me to be a good baseball player, I had to practice, and I started practicing as a little kid to just better to pitch a ball. All right? I didn't have any brothers and sisters. I didn't have anybody to pitch with. So I learned how to throw the ball on the roof, and I'd stand up under so I couldn't see where the ball was, and I'd die for that sucker if I needed to die for it. That's how I learned how to play baseball. Take a rubber ball. I've told my grandsons down in Texas, you want to get good in baseball, here's what you must do. You've got to practice almost every day. you got to go out. And I told them, I bought them some <coughs> rubber baseball, and it's rubber, real soft. You throw that thing. You want to be an infielder, be a grounder, to hit, be able to catch hot ones, you slam that thing. And you keep it. If you want to get better, you get closer to that brick wall. Ooh. You want to get better, get closer to that brick wall. You understand what I'm saying? Because when it bounces off that, it's like a bat. You don't know where that ball is going to go on the ground. But you do what you need to do, and you get better and better and better and gooder and gooder. All right? Mm-hmm. Well, Boston, I was an all-star player. All my years in baseball made the all-star third base. Okay? But it was because I worked at it, was faithful to practice, 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 practice. Okay? Faithfulness is essential to jobs, to sports. Hey, how about school? Yeah. Little Johnny with all F's, he wasn't too faithful, was he? <laughs> faithful to marriage? You name anything where we shouldn't be faithful to other than the bar rooms and the dance halls and the wickedness. Right. Works across the board, doesn't it? Faithful in living for God. Faithful in the Word of God. Faithful in praying. Faithful in witnessing, handing out gospel tracts. Faithful in serving God. I go because I want to be faithful to the end for God. Do I always feel like going to prison? Shoot, no. Are you with me? I'll be every week, one to two prisons each week. This week, twice. Next week, a long one, long haul. And the end week, I'll be back in Poco, which I'm excited about, man. We'll have a full church this next time, God willing, no building get locked down, hopefully. But I'm just simply saying, man, just be faithful. Faithful unto death. Let me ask everybody one last quiz, and I'm close. If you have a car, and you go out to start that car every week, it only starts six times. Is that car faithful? No. No, it's a full one. My four starts on the same. Sometimes, you know, when I'm preaching, it just makes me say things I probably ought not to say. <laughs> Got a refrigerator? And you can boast, well, that's a good refrigerator. It works 28 days a month out of 30 and 31. Is a faithful refrigerator? No. Got a water heater. Every time you go to take a shower, two times a month, you don't get hot water. Faithful water heater? No. Do you see see where I'm going with this? What's the problem? They're not faithful. But Christians have the idea, oh, if I bounce in church for Thanksgiving and Christmas, I'm faithful. I'm serious. That's sad. If I just go when I want to or feel like it, I'm faithful. God has a whole different view of what our faith is. Oh, yes. The date was May 19th, literally. 1780. I must have sent you 1980, maybe. No doubt you copied my slide, didn't you? Or you copied what I, copied I sent it. you. Nin- I mean, 1780. No, that's fine. It's fine. It's okay. 1780. The location happened to be Hartford, Connecticut. All of a sudden, in the midst at noonday, something no one had seen before up to that point. All of a sudden, noonday sun, bright sunny day, warm day, all of a sudden it started getting gray outside. They'd seen that as a storm before. Then the gray turned to dark gray. And then before they could even believe it or not, it turned to pitch black. Noonday. Sun out. But it ain't shining. People fail literally to their knees all over the place. In Hartford, Connecticut, and probably other places. I just know what happened in Hartford. In fear, religious people and non-religious people fear. The judgment day is here. The judgment day is falling. The judgment day is coming. 
while they were doing what they were even in the House of Representatives, which happened to be in session that very day and hour. Many of those who had been sent by their counties to represent their county in government, many of them started fearing. Some fell there in fear. Some and many wanted to dismiss the session because the judgment of God's fallen. Like they could do anything about it. <laughs> there was a Speaker of the House for that particular day and hour. His name was Colonel Davenport. Colonel Davenport. Now I gotta put this slide up here to make sure that I get it right. Oh, the quote's not there. Okay. And I can almost add a little bit, I think. It's okay. I don't see it. Nope. Okay. Mm -hmm. He made a statement. He said, Men, if this is the judgment of God, read it enough to almost quote it to you. If this is the judgment of God that is falling, then we can do nothing. But if this is not the judgment of God, or even if it is, we can do what we should do. Listen to this next statement. We should just simply stay and do our duty. I recommend we call those who would go get the candles and light all the candles. And basically, he just simply said, we're going to stay. Why? Because Colonel Davenport was simply stating, I want us to be in duty. Is that what the church is recommended to do? Faithful and occupied. So it comes. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. <coughs> Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around. Can I ask a quick question of you first in this building? And that is simply this. How many in this room could say, Preacher, I thank God. Oh, how I thank God that He touched me one day. One day I got saved by the grace of God. Never forgot it. Never will forget it. And I'm glad to be able to say both to God as he knows my heart and to you that I know that I'm thankful that I'm saved, I'm sure I know that if I die thank God, heaven one day is going to be my home not because of me but because of Jesus and what he's done for me when he saved me and you're not ashamed and you're grateful to God for what he has done in your heart and your life <clears throat> would you raise your hand real high and simply say I thank God that I know that I know that I know this Jesus, this Savior. God bless those hands. Thank you so much. Could I ask a second question in here? If you could not raise your hand, why not? Do you know that you know that you know? Good thing to know. People die every day. I've got eight cancer patients on my prayer sheet at home. Every one of them has got some pretty serious things going on in their bodies. Can I just simply tell you, friend, you don't know how long you'll live. I had somebody this morning say, oh, he's coming back uh, maybe next week. Eh, maybe not. He may not be here next week. We don't know. God's got a point with everybody here. You understand that? I would say it's important unto all men to die. But after this, comes the judgment. You're going to meet God. Only two ways to meet him, prepared or unprepared. Ready or not ready. How do you rate today with God, with Jesus Christ? Would there be someone in this room alone that could say with a raised hand, Preacher, I don't know for sure I'm saved. Don't know for sure. I've been saved. But I need to know that. I would like to know that. Preacher, would you remember me today in prayer? I'm not going to embarrass you, but I promise you that. But you could just put your hand up and say, indicate, Preacher, pray for me. I need to be saved. I need what you talked about. I want to know for sure. Pray for me. Anybody like that? Put it up real quick. Put it right back down. Anybody? Up. Put it right back down. Do it in prison every, every week. Do it again twice this week. Put it up, put it right back down. All right? Let me turn to those of you online. Do you know that you know that you know? If not, would you trust this Jesus? Would you trust this Christ? Would you understand three things? Number one, first thing, in order to be saved, you've got to be a sinner. You've got to know that you've sinned. You're lost without God's Son, Jesus Christ. All sin comes short of the glory of God. Easy as pie. 
Lying makes you a liar. Steal makes you a thief. On and on we could go. Sin is sin. We're all sinners. Born by birth and by choice. That sin cannot go to heaven. Your life in sin cannot go to heaven. So God has to forgive it. God has to do something about it. And the good news is, thank God he did, and much, much more. He sent Jesus. The Bible says it like this in chapter 5, verse 8 of Romans. God committed his love or showed his love toward you. While you were a sinner, Christ Jesus died for you. He died for me too, thank God. 53 years ago, I settled that and discovered that. Best decision I ever made. Save me from hell. Save me from drunkenness. Save me from this. Save me from that. Man, my life's been turned inside out and upside down and right side up. Thank God. Because of salvation in Jesus. He did the same for you, friend. He loves you today. He died for you, showing you the depth of his love. And then the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The penalty for sin is hail. That's what the Bible's teaching there. The word death means to be separated from God. So it's hail. The good news is you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven with me and others. So how do you do that, preacher? The rest of the verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life or heaven through the Lord Jesus. Every gift is free to the receiver, but bought and paid for by somebody else that gave the gift to them. And thank God Jesus paid in full your way to heaven. All you got to do is believe and receive him as your Savior. So how do I do that, preacher? Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall, not might, not hope so, not maybe so, shall be saved. That word saved is a huge Greek word. It means multiplicity of things. But basically it means saved for heaven, for all eternity. Settled and done. Would you trust him today? Would you believe on this Christ? Would you call on this Jesus today? Would you pray something like I lead inmates in prisons? Something like this, would you pray? You want to be saved, sir. If you want to be saved, ma'am, if you want to be saved, teenager, would you call on this Jesus today? Would you call on God and the Father to save you today? Would you pray something like, Dear God, I understand I'm a sinner. I believe though you love me. And I believe you, Jesus, died for my sin on the cross. I believe you were buried. And I do believe, thank God, you live today. And that's you dealing with my heart. And right now, Jesus, I invite you to come in to my heart, my life, forgive all of my sin, and be my Savior. Thank you for saving and for forgiving me. Help me now to live for you. In Jesus' name. If you sincerely prayed that, believe that, done that, we have a little booklet we hand out in prison. We hand it out here when people get saved here. We've been doing it for years. It's called Hitting the Mark. If you'd like to write for one of those, we have the address on the screen. Write for it. We'll let you know. We'll send it to you postage free, and it'll show you what it means to become a Christian and what it means to be saved. And now that you're saved, what does God have in store for your newfound faith and your newfound life? My Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you today for the freedom and the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you for the messages you have for us on the churches. Help us to take it to heart, to practice, put it in shoe leather, and live it out each and every day faithfully is our prayer. Help us to be an Antipas, faithful if need be, literally unto death is our prayer. Make us faithful. Help us to be faithful in all things pertaining to thee is our prayer. We'll praise you and we'll thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's church said, Amen. Amen.